I've come to say today that in these days when we are killing ourselves trying to live, people still think that they can find peace of mind in pills. They try to eat their way to ecstasy. They try to drink their way to pleasure. They try to smoke their way to settled nerves. They try to puff their way to popularity and push their way to power. They try to bully their way to friendship and bum their way to world peace. But I've come today to say I know where a poor man has a chance. <laughs> Where a sick man can get well, where an ignorant man can become wise, a bad man can be made good, a good man can be made better, and even a dead man can be made alive. It's in Jesus Christ. Everywhere I go, people are curious about my name. They want to know what the S.M. are for. And I tell them that's for Shedrick Meshach. <laughs> and they don't believe it. And when I assure them that it is Shedrick Meshach, then they ask, well, what happened to Abednego? <laughs> and I tell them I had to stop using Abednego because... People misunderstood me. They thought I was saying Shedrick, Meshach, and a bad Negro. in Southwestern Seminary, my house burned, and the students started calling me Shedrick Noshack Lockridge. <laughs> the title of my talk today is the Lordship of Christ. The text comes from the book of Philippians, second chapter, verses 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We are forever blowing bubbles, looking for ships that never come in, chasing pots of gold at the end of receding rainbows. Now, when a child blows bubbles, he's not concerned about value. He's thrilled as long as the bubble lasts, and when it bursts, he simply blows another. How do you expect your ships to come in when you've sent no ships out? And you never will find that proverbial pot of gold because you try to ignore him who has the rainbow wrapped around his shoulder. 
You remember back during the 60s, the offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface playpens and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now that shouldn't have been surprising to us because the Bible has informed us that the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions like, who assassinated God? And what coroner was called? And who signed his death certificate? And who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased? <laughs> In what obituary column did you find his name? And why was I not notified? I'm a member of the family. God is spirit. He does not die by pronouncement. He does not die by assassination. He does not die by denial. He just does not die. He's as real today as he was to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you'll trust him, he will be as true to you as he was to Abram when Abram was called to go out not knowing whether he went. If you will trust him, he will be as evident to you as he was to Moses when God manifested himself in a burning bush. Now, when they couldn't get anywhere with the God is dead idea, now in the 70s, one of the top theological questions is, where did God come from? Now, the primary purpose of God in creation was to prepare a moral being spiritually and intellectually capable of worshiping him. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when there was empty blackness and void formlessness, and darkness was on the face of the deep, when time was yet unknown, thou in thy bliss and majesty did live and love alone. He called light out of darkness. He called cosmos out of chaos. He called order out of confusion. But the question still clamors for an answer. Where did God come from? The answer is he came from nowhere. Now that's theologically correct and it's biblically sound. For Habakkuk said, I saw him when he left the hills of Teman, the Holy One from Mount Perrin. And Teman simply means nothing or nowhere. So he came from nowhere. I made that statement in Detroit some time ago, and a man talked with me after the service, and he said, Preacher, let's be reasonable about this thing. You up there tonight talking about God came from nowhere. That doesn't make sense. Let's be reasonable about it. I said, All right. If you just want to be reasonable about it, the reason God came from nowhere, there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. <laughs> and coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he had to stand on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach, and caught something when there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. <laughs> now you'll find that in Job 26 and 7 that he hung this world on nothing. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will, and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence, and sparks flew therefrom, and he caught them on the tips of his fingers, and flung them out into space, and bedecked the heavens with stars, and nobody said a word.
The reason nobody said anything, there wasn't anybody there to say anything. So God himself said, that's good. And God hath given Christ a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now the hinges of human history have turned by the strength of the insignificant man who has linked his life with the Lordship of Christ. Rivers of civilization have cut new courses because of the courage of men who have come under the loving Lordship of Jesus. But the question is being asked, is this topic relevant? What is in it for us in our kind of a day? Well, for the lost, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the municipality, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. For the nation, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. For those who claim to be committed, acknowledgement of Christ's authority must be accompanied by absolute obedience to his commandments. That's the reason Jesus asked, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? There are four classes of men who may be described by their relationship to the Lord. One, those who neither call him Lord, nor do the things which he says. Two, those who call him Lord, but do not the things which he says. Three, those who do not call him Lord, but do the things which he says. Four, those who both call him Lord and do the things which he says. Now, Lord is not a word to be taken upon our lips lightly and glibly and meaninglessly. It is a title which must be taken upon our lips with godly fear. We can see what Jesus meant uh, when he says, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Everyone is mastered by someone or something. Christ alone deserves first place. We need a strength stronger than ourselves. We need a strength strong enough to help us to stand the stresses and the strains of our struggles. And the rightful Lord of our lives is Jesus Christ. Now, in order for him to be the Prince of, the Prince of Peace, a coronation service must take place. You must crown him king in your own heart. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now these are the words of that man who walked all over the pagan world turned every house into a chapel and every street corner into a pulpit to proclaim the Lordship of Christ. He lit the lamp of the gospel even in Caesar's household. He disturbed the nest of eagles and sent them screaming across the Roman sky. He honeycombed the land with the Christian church and then sat in Nero's cell in chains and conquered Rome by writing letters. In his letter to the Philippians, 
Paul pinned their rest and announcement that God hath given Christ a name that's above every name. And he envisions the time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul declared that Jesus has the unqualified supremacy. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the head of the church. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the firstborn from the dead. In all things, he has the preeminence. He precedes all others in his priority. He exceeds all others in his superiority. And he succeeds all others in his finality. Why, he's the master of the mighty He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. In his letter to the Romans, Paul declared that we all belong to Christ and are responsible to him for everything that we do. We live unto the Lord, and when we die, we die unto the Lord. Yea, the great end for which Christ died and lived again, live always, is that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now this word Lord means having power our authority. The Great Commission is based on the claims of our Savior's Lordship. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things Whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Lord means ownership. His lordship is based on his ownership. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Now he didn't have to put a signature in the corner of a sunrise. He's the owner. He didn't have to put a laundry mark in the lapel of a meadow. He's the owner. He didn't have to carve his initials in the side of the mountain. He's the owner. He didn't have to put a brand on the cattle of a thousand hills. He's the owner. He didn't have to take out a copyright on the songs that he gives the birds to sing. He's the owner. Beyond the human level, the word Lord stands as a reverent allusion to God. Now, the Orthodox Hebrew in Jesus' day is in our own. Would not even pronounce the sacred name, God, Jehovah, or Yahweh. Instead, when he read the sacred and incommunicable communicable name of God, he would simply say, The Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, Christians have applied this title to Christ in the latter usage. On either the human or the divine level, the title Lord is a mark of respect and implied pledge of obedience. Once Simon Peter stood before a hostile crowd and said, God has made that same Christ whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Christ represents the thing that God has done to redeem us. Lord represents what we ought to do because we are redeemed. 
Now, we ought to call him owner because he possesses absolutely our lives. In him we live and move and have our being. We ought to call him owner. We ought to call him father and be obedient sons and daughters. For he's our only hope and he's our only help. God is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in trouble. Therefore shall not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh walls to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder and burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted among the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Jesus is Lord because he came down the stairway of heaven. Born in Bethlehem, hid in Egypt, brought up in Nazareth, baptized in Jordan, tempted in the wilderness. He performed miracles by the roadside. He healed multitudes without medicine and made no charges for his service. He conquered everything that came up against him. He took your sins and mine and went out on Calvary and there died. While hanging on that cross, Jesus said several things. But when the thief taunted him and said, If you be the Christ, come down from the cross and save yourself and us. To that taunt, Jesus never said a mumbling word. But the silence seemed to have said, You just wait until Sunday morning. And I'll show you, I'll show you that it's better to come up out of a grave than it is to come down from a cross. And he dropped his head in the locks of his shoulder and he died. I mean, he really died. Don't pay any attention to a swoon theory. He died. Whoa, oh, he... He died until the sun refused to shine. He died until the veil in the temple was rent in twain. He died until, Matthew said, the dead got up out of the grave and walked the streets after the resurrection. He died. The centurion says, surely this must have been the Son of God. I'm trying to say he died. But I don't like... Ah, ah. I don't like to, I don't like to stay there talking about he died. I, I like to rush on and say he was buried in Joseph's new tomb. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. Now that used to bother me. The one who holds the waters in the hollow of his hand and meets out the heavens with a span comprehends the dust and weighs the mountains in a scale and a hill in the balance. The one who walked on the brow of nothing and with a gesture of his hands worlds were formed. Scooped out the seas with the palm of his hand, dug deep the gorges, piled up the hills and propped up the mountains by his will. The moon and stars lean on his arm. Being buried in a borrowed tomb. Well, he wasn't going to stay there long, so it bowed to the top. Yes! 
He just went down in that grave and stayed in the grave long enough to clean it out and make it a pleasant place to wait for the resurrection. And on schedule, he got up with every form of power in the orbit of his omnipotence. Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, men are thinking that maybe one of these days his power is going to fail him. They're thinking that one of these days that somebody will wrestle his power from him. Some have in mind they're going to destroy his power. Well, brother, if you're going to destroy his power, what are you going to use for power? <laughs> if you try to destroy him by fire, he'll refuse to burn. If you try to destroy him by water, he'll walk on the water. If you try to destroy him by a strong wind, the tempest will lick his hand and lay down at his feet. If you try to destroy him by law, you'll find no fault in him. If you try to destroy him by a seal of an empire, he'll break it. If you try to destroy him by putting him in a grave, he'll rise. If you try to destroy him by rejection or ignoring him, soon you'll hear a still small voice saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If a man will open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is the pearl from paradise. He's the gem from the glory land. He's truth's fairest jewel and he's time's choicest theme. He's life's strongest cord and he's light's clearest ray. He's purity's whitest peak. He's joy's deepest tide. His name stands as a synonym for free healing, friendly help, and full salvation. His blessed name is like honey to the taste. It's like harmony to the ear. It's like health to the soul. It's like hope to the heart. He's higher than the heavens of heavens, and he's holier than the holy of holies. In his birth is our significance. In his life is our example. In his cross is our redemption, and in his resurrection is our hope. At his birth, men came from the east, and at his death, men came from the west. And the east and the west met in him. Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigned. And at his name, to his name, in his name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, the young knee, every knee, the old knee, every knee, the white knee, every knee, the black knee, every knee. Wounded knee, every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, uh, many say, I've got a lot of living to do. I'll uh, accept him as Savior and I'll acknowledge him as Lord. Uh, but I've got a lot of living to do. You don't really live until you come to him. Who said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And then some I hear praying, Lord, when I must go somewhere and crawl up in a dying bed and learn how to die. Brother, who told you you were going anywhere else? <laughs> and who told you you were going to have the strength or the time to crawl up in a dying bed? And, and who told you you had to learn how to die? You learn how to live. And as you live, so you die. But I'm not going to wait because borderline salvation is better than being lost, but that's too dangerous to risk. That's the reason the prophet said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and he will have mercy to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I'm not going to wait. I acknowledge him as my Lord now. The Lord is love. And his love is stronger than sin. It's deeper than sorrow and it's mightier than death. 
The Lord is my light. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my high tower. The Lord is my shield and my buckler. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You know, this old world is a wilderness of want. We're always wanting something. A man will break his health down trying to get well. And then he'll turn around, spend his wealth trying to get his health back. If it isn't one thing, it's another. From the rocking in the cradle to the folding in the grave, something is always running out. If your bank account gets low, then your blood pressure gets high. <laughs> if you've got money, your health breaks down. If you've got a job, your eyesight gets dim. If you've got food on your table, your faith gets weak. If it's not your enemies bothering you, it's your so-called friends. If it's not your kinfolk mooching off of you, it's your church folk. And while you're building up over here, it's falling apart over there. But the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. A little girl was asked to recite this verse, and she said, The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. They said she's wrong. I said she's right. The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. I shall not want for rest, for he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I shall not want for refreshment, for he leadeth me beside the still waters. I shall not want for forgiveness, for he restoreth my soul. I shall not want for guidance, for he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I shall not want for companionship, for yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. I shall not want for comfort, for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I shall not want for sustenance or provision, for thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I shall not want for joy, for thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I shall not want for anything in this life, for goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall not want for anything in the life to come, for I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I didn't say I'll camp or tent or tabernacle, but I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'll dwell in a land where we'll never grow old. I'll dwell out there where the silence of eternity is interpreted by love. I'll dwell in the sun-kissed regions of an unclouded day. Dwell in a city that hath foundation, whose building makers God. Dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus Christ is Lord.